Well, good morning. Welcome to Grace Church. Let me extend my welcome to you as well this morning. Uh, my name is Thomas, Thomas Bishop, and uh, it's a real privilege to be with you this morning, uh, continuing our series, None Like Him, where we're going to be looking at the attributes of God, what makes God who he is, and what makes him different to us. So I want to begin by telling you a little bit about me. Um, as a child, I was one of those really annoying children um, that loved to answer every question. I was always asking why, I wanted to know more information, and if I got something wrong, I'd be absolutely devastated. Knowledge was so important to me. I remember once being asked to draw a 24-hour clock, and actually I drew a circle and put the 24 numbers on it. And at six years old, I can still remember that. It still haunts me now that I got that thing wrong. You see, I wanted to be all-knowing. I wanted to know everything. And yet, that was impossible for me to achieve. Now, you would think growing up that I'd learn the error of my ways, and, and that wouldn't be a problem for me now. But actually, if I'm honest with you, and if my wife was here and you asked her, she'd say, it's still a little bit of an issue for me. Um, that I love to share knowledge. I love to pretend that I know more than I do. Quite often, we'll be having a conversation with someone and uh, we'll be talking about something, and I'll start going into some deep, informative uh, bit of information uh, about the subject. And then she'll look at me and say, darling, do you, do you actually know what you're, you're talking about right now, or are you just making this up? And more often than not, I have to say, well, I have a little bit of information, but yeah, I'm, I'm making that up. But I am learning. After 10 years of marriage, she is helping, by God's grace, to, uh, <laughs> to let me change a little bit and uh, become less all-knowing um, and more in line with what I actually am which is limited and lacking knowledge in many, many areas. But anyway, this morning we're going to be talking about God and how he is omniscient, how he is all-knowing, and what that means for us, what the effect of that is on our lives, and how it should leave us in looking at God in awe and wonder. But then also that there's this desire in us to be like God. There's this desire in us to try and uh, be more than we are, and the reasons behind that and the effects that have on our lives. So I want to give you a couple of quotes. Uh, Proverbs 17, 28 says, Even fools are thought wise if they keep silent, and the discerning if they hold their tongues. Or Mark Twain says this, Better to remain silent and be, be thought a fool than to speak and remove all doubt. That's certainly one of the challenges in my life when it comes to knowledge. So throughout this series, as I said, we've been exploring um, the attributes of God that apply to him. And like I said, the, the purpose of this is twofold. It's to, it's to look at God and to, to point people to him and say, this is who our God is. This is why he's worthy of our worship. But also to look at ourselves and say, actually, when we try to be like him, when we try to be something that we're not, actually, it, it often ends in misery and disaster or idolatry. And so I want to address some of those things this morning when it comes to God being all-knowing. And we're going to look at, um, at some of our human desires and some of the reasons that, that we try to imitate God in this area. And then we're going to look at who God is and look at, and, and look at how wonderful it is that God is an all-knowing God and what that means for us and the joy and the peace that that should bring to us. So that's where we're going to go. So what we'll do is we'll, uh, we'll start by looking at, at human desires for knowledge. You know, it's a good thing, isn't it, to acknowledge that actually to learn new things is, is good. You know, we are, we are creatures that, from the moment we're conceived in the womb, uh, we, want to, we, we begin to learn, our senses begin to develop. And so then as we grow up, that we, we become more knowledgeable, we learn new skills, maybe we go to school, then we go to university. And so, so knowledge in and of itself is a good thing. The Bible says in, in Proverbs 1, which we call the, the wisdom literature, uh, it says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And so actually, sometimes we pursue knowledge for knowledge's sake, but actually there's a better way to pursue knowledge, and that is, that is to fear the Lord. We want knowledge of God, not just knowledge for knowledge's sake. And so, also a little knowledge, you know the saying, a little knowledge can be a bad thing. See, the problem comes when we desire knowledge for the sake of knowledge, or perhaps to use that knowledge for wrong motives, maybe to gain control or to, um, to have more, more security or more wealth or more power. So often we can be driven to, to gain knowledge for those reasons. And as I said before, many occasions I, I've often pretended to be smarter than I really am, and I come out looking like a fool. But why do we do this? Why do we, why do we have these, these great big arguments with people and then we replay them in our mind and we, we think back through all the things that we could have said and we suddenly find ourselves feeling puffed up, thinking, yeah, if I'd just said that, if I'd, if I'd laid this bit of knowledge on them, that would have, 
that would have really nailed it, wouldn't it? I'd have been powerful in that moment. And so there's all these temptations that go on within us to show ourselves as more knowledgeable than we really are. See, ironically, um, we do this, I think, often to, to show people how clever we are, to, to perhaps draw people to worship us. But it actually has the opposite effect, doesn't it? I mean, we all know people like me. We all know people who are, are out there that are a bit puffed up. They're a little bit too smart for their own good. And actually, the, the really intelligent people know how to hold their tongue. The really intelligent people <laughs> with the most knowledge, they're often the ones that sit there quietly and just let everything else go on around them. And so we can find ourselves pursuing knowledge uh, for all kinds of different reasons. And there's good ways to pursue it, and there's bad ways to pursue it. But actually to pursue the knowledge of God, and to pursue and learn more about who he is, that is a good way to pursue knowledge. But also we can pursue knowledge that's not meant for us. It's another area that we can go into. See, there are some things that God, being God, just does not need us to know, either yet or ever. Um, like the future, for example. Um, there is a desire in all of us, isn't there, to, to know the future. If I just knew the lottery numbers, Lord, you know, I would take that information and I would, I would win the lottery and, and I'd give 90% of it to charity and I'd just keep 10%, a million pounds or so for myself. So, Lord, really what I'm saying is I want to give away a few million pounds. So why don't you give me that future information? You know, we can be tempted, can't we, to think that if we knew the future, we would use that information to, to serve and bless others. But actually, God says, no, no, that is for me to know. Jesus said, didn't he, that, that it's the Father that knows these things. And so it's a temptation in all of us to, to try and discover things that actually aren't meant for us to know. And uh, there's a really good example of this right at the beginning of the Bible. And so I'd like us to have a look at uh, Genesis chapter 2 and, uh, and then into Genesis 3. And this is, this is, like I say, right at the beginning of the Bible, we're looking at Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And uh, I'm just going to read a few verses uh, from, from those passages. And what we'll see is, is that actually one of the, the first things that, that our, our ancestors all those years ago did um, in a good relationship with God, in the comfort and the security of the Garden of Eden, where every need was met, actually they pursued a knowledge that was not meant for them. So let's read this together. So Genesis 2, um, 15, 17, and down to Genesis 3. So the Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. And then we move down to Genesis 3, verse 1 to 9. It says, Now the snake was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? That was a lie. He didn't say that. The woman said to the snake, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. Now, God didn't say you must not touch it. You will most, you will not certainly die. The snake said to the woman, for God knows when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. And you will be like God, knowing good from evil. So there we see it right at the beginning of the Bible that there is this temptation presented to the man and the woman by the serpent, by, by the devil, who says to them, actually, no, God's, God's withholding something good. He's withholding knowledge, the knowledge of good and evil. And, and you shouldn't fear that. You should, you should desire that. You should want it for yourself. And so it carries on. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. And the eyes of both of them were opened. They had knowledge. But then they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? So what happens here? God says to them, you can eat from anything. You can have whatever you want. But there is a tree over there. Just just leave that one alone. Now, we might look back at that story and think, well, did that happen or not? Um, whatever you believe about that, I personally believe that this is an account of, of our ancestors. But whatever you believe about that, what we can see is that the very same thing happens today. 
If you put a child in a room with 20 things to play with and say, but there's one over there that you can't play with, it doesn't take that long to see that child move towards that one item that they're not allowed to have. It's in our nature, it's in our, our broken, fallen human nature to want to have the things that God says we shouldn't have. Now, God knows best, like a parent knows best over a child. Often my children will come to me and they say, Daddy, can we have this or can we have that? And it just sounds so simple and so easy to give them. And uh, it's like, Daddy, can you buy me this? Can we go on Amazon? Can you buy that? And it, it's like, well, actually, you don't know the harm that thing is going to do for you. You don't know the cost implications of that thing. And so there is a, a lack of knowledge there. And when I say, well, no, darling, you, you, you don't need that right now. You can't have that. It seems like I'm withholding something so good from them. And so often we can approach God with that same kind of attitude. We pray hard and we, we ask God for things. And God, will you let me have this? Will you just give me that? And when our all-knowing father says, well, hang on a minute, I, I know better for you. I know what's best for you. We can get quite grumpy with God and say, oh, God, why are you withholding this thing from me? It just seems so good. And so this desire to have things that God says we, we are not ready yet to have is just part of our fallen and broken nature. And so when these things happen to us, we want to ask why. When, we, when bad things come into our life, when difficult situations are allowed to happen to us, we look to God and we say, why is this happening? And we can often become distant from God. We can turn our back on God and think that somehow he doesn't care for us, that somehow he's not for us. And we come away from the truth of, of the Bible, which tells us that God loves us, that God is for us, that he is with us, that he wants all people to be saved, and that he has a plan and a purpose for our life and that we can be with him for eternity. And yet we see that and we know that, and then something comes along that we don't fully understand. And God says, no, I need to hold this back from you. And yet we find ourselves turning away from God and turning towards the desire for things that we're not yet to have. But what are the other ways we can pursue knowledge? And we'll look a little bit more at God in a moment and, and how his all-knowing is, is so important in this. Uh, there's a few things I do, actually, to gain more knowledge. There's uh, reading the news. I, I love the news. I love to wake up in the morning and get my news app out. And after 20 minutes, I've gone from reading really important headlines to finding out what Harry and Meghan have, have just released as their latest statement um, or seeing what's going on somewhere in North America. Um, things that are completely irrelevant to my lives. And, and, you know, I'm waking up in the morning next to my lovely wife and I could be reading my Bible, but instead I'm, I'm pursuing information. And I'm saying, well, I need to know what's going on today. And um, rather than having a conversation with the ones that I love or maybe spending time with my kids, we find this information, this information age that we live in, is just so easy, isn't it, to keep filling our head with more and more knowledge. And yet, actually, our brains are a little bit like sieves and that knowledge comes out the other way. What about things like gossip? That's another area. What is gossip? Gossip is, is, is pursuing information, isn't it? Or sharing information that actually we shouldn't be sharing. We're taking knowledge and we're passing it on about other people or we're trying to find out things about other people. And actually, that can be quite destructive, can't it, in our relationships where we try to get things, uh, we, get, we learn things about people um, that actually they're not for us to know. So again, it's trying to get more knowledge about Hey Siri or Hey Google, how many of your devices all just went off then? You know, we have these things in our hands, these smartphones, and we can just ask any question we want and we get an answer back. Whether we know that's a correct answer or not is, is a different matter. But we just have this information available to us all the time. And then you've got things like social media. I mean, how much time do you spend scrolling through Facebook or scrolling through um, all the different uh, sites, Instagram and um, Pinterest, and looking at different things and saying, oh, that's interesting, isn't it? And uh, these things can just be a bottomless pit of information. And how much good is it really doing us? You get things like FOMO. You know what FOMO is? The fear of missing out. You could be out having a perfectly lovely time, and then suddenly you see that person that you don't really like. Oh, they're doing something better than me. Oh no, now I feel miserable about what I'm doing. Again, this kind of knowledge, this kind of information that we all get consume, consumed with or, or we consume um, can be so destructive for our lives. But you know what? There is good news. You know, we can be controlled by some of these things. We can, we can end up in places like anxiety and, and real disappointment or even addicted to some of these things. But the good news is, is that Jesus came to set us free from the things that control us 
But actually, when we believe the truth about him, the truth will set us free. And then finally, one more thing before we talk about God's knowledge is procrastination. Have you ever found that having too much information can just destabilize you, can just cause you to uh, be paralyzed? And uh, I've done this before when we're looking at holidays and we're, we're trying to find a place to go and there's just so much more information than we need. And you can end up with so many different options and so many good things. It's like, I don't know which one to pick. And then you don't make any decision at all because it's just sort of blowing your mind that there's so many different choices. And so they call it paralysis by analysis. And maybe we can all be a bit guilty of that as well. Looking at TripAdvisor to find out the best restaurant or whatever it is. And so these are all ways that I think as human beings we, we seek knowledge. We, we want to know more information than sometimes is actually good for us. And so what's the solution? Well, you see, we need to allow God to be God. And we need to be content with our own limitations, giving up the control and, and the glory to God who is limitless. Only he is all-knowing. And we recognize that when we recognize this, we actually take the pressure off ourselves to become who God has made us to be. So what does it mean? Let's look at God then. So what about God? Um, that God is all-knowing or omniscient. Uh, there's a guy called A.W. Tozer who, who wrote some really good things on, on God and who he is and his character. And he says this, he is omniscient which means that he knows in one free, effortless act, all matter, all spirit, all relationships, all events. In other words, God has perfect knowledge of everything inside and outside of the universe at all times and in all places. Not just everything that has happened, not even everything that will happen, but actually also everything that could have happened, every possible possibility and outcome. He knows the very thoughts of our minds. He knows every hair on our head. He knows every atom in the universe. And he ordained and created and made all of that. And he's known it from the beginning of time. And he'll know it till the end of time and beyond and outside of that because God is limitless. God is infinite. And this is impossible for us to fully grasp, to get our heads around as is with all these things that we've discussed in this series, it's, it's, it's really too hard for us to fully understand it, but we can read in Scripture, we can read in the Bible that this is how God describes himself. And so let's look at some of these passages and, uh, and take a look at how the Bible tells us about God. Now the Bible, I believe, is the, the Word of God. It is, it is God because God is all-powerful. He's also able to ordain that human beings could put words down and that they could be an exact expression through the power of the Holy Spirit of what God wants to communicate with us. And so when I take the Bible, I see that as, as part of God's revelation to me about who he is and about what he's like. And we also see that in the person of Jesus as well, who comes and reveals to us what God is like, fully God and fully man. And so let's read a few passages. So Job 37, 14 to 16 says, Listen to this, Job. Stop and consider God's wonders. Do you know how God controls the clouds and makes his lightning flash? Do you know how the clouds hang poised? Those wonders of him who is perfect in knowledge. And then Matthew 6, verses 7 to 8. This is Jesus talking to him. When you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. God already knows before we ask. Because he knows everything. He knows all the things we're ever going to think and say. And then Psalm 147 verse 4 says this. He determines the number of the stars and calls them each by name. Now we know, don't we, from uh, scientists that, that tell us about the universe and the stars and Hubble Space Telescope. There are billions and billions and billions of not just stars, but of galaxies apparently out there. And yet God just knows instantly every single star by name has perfect recall, never forgets anything. Well, what about Jesus himself? As I said, he is fully God, and he has the same attributes as God our Heavenly Father has. And uh, I love this story in, in Luke, and it's quite subtle, this, but it's about a Pharisee and a prostitute, and then they're sat with Jesus, and they're, they're met with him, and, um, and you've got the prostitute who's just washing Jesus' feet with her tears. And Luke uh, seven thirty nine says this, and you have to sort of listen carefully to see this. But it says, when the Pharisee who'd invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, now bear in mind he said to himself, so he's thinking it, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him, what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him. So he thought it, 
But Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Now, I think this must have made the Pharisees very nervous because Jesus did this quite a lot with them. They thought something. The Bible records that thought because Jesus responds to it. And God is the same today. God knows our thoughts. He knows exactly what we're thinking and how we're feeling. We cannot hide anything from him. And then finally, let's look at Psalm 139, a wonderful uh, just uh, uh, passage about God, about who God is and, and the effect that it has on us. And so this is King David just, just talking about God. He says, you have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit, when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before. You lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. He's pondering on the, the majesty and the glory of God, and he's just saying, this just blows my mind. And yet it's such a comfort and a reassurance to him because he knows he's not God, but actually there is a God who is God, who loves him and cares for him. And then not only that, the Bible is full of prophecy. And so prophecy is where God speaks into the future through a prophet. And, uh, and often we can kind of almost dismiss this because the Bible was written such a long time ago that a lot of the prophecy in it was then fulfilled later on in the Bible. And yet it can be often be a thousand years between God saying one thing and, and then that thing coming true. And yet if we look back historically and through the archaeological evidence, we can see so often that, that actually God's prophecy, God's, God's speaking in the future... Uh, is always right. And then we have books like Revelation as well, which also point forward into time. We talk about the, uh, the return of Jesus and things like that. And so God is, God is able to speak into the future because he's already there. God has complete knowledge of what is going to happen and how things are going to end. And so we take the Bible and we hold it, knowing that these are the words of God and what God says will happen, will happen. And there is a real confidence and reassurance that comes from that. And then finally, we, not, we know that we learn that God not only knows our thoughts and actions, but also our motives for doing things as well. And Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 4, My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring light to what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. So what are we going to do? What are we, how are we going to respond to this information? Well, I think there's two ways that we can, you can hear this this morning, and I don't know where you're at. I don't know what your relationship with God is like. Maybe you're listening to us for the first time. Uh, maybe you don't know God, and you're just trying to work all of this out. Or maybe you've been a Christian for 50 years, and you love Jesus, and you know him, and you trust him. But how does this information affect? How should it affect us? Well, I think there's two ways we can respond. One, I, I think we could be terrified. Um, and I don't necessarily think that's a bad place to be to start with um, because, as I said at the beginning in Proverbs 1, it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Um, but there are different ways to fear God. You can fear him like a, a tyrant, like a, a dangerous enemy, um, or you can fear him as a loving, heavenly father that is all-powerful and all-knowing. And I think that is the, the right fear of God, but we need to be able to stand in front of him, not like Adam and Eve, who were naked and ashamed and hid, but actually we need to have our shame taken away so that we can stand before God without that shame. And so that's where we need Jesus to come and do that for us. And so let's just finish by talking about him. And so Jesus, the, the Son of God, we read in John 3:16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whosoever, whoever, whoever you are this morning, if you believe in him, that you will not perish, but you'll have everlasting life in Jesus. And how does that happen? Well, Jesus, you see, he, he is God. He comes to earth as a man. He comes and, and lives and experiences his life as we do. But then he lives a sinless life. He doesn't walk in the ways that we do. He doesn't disobey his Father in heaven like we do. But then God chooses to to pour out his perfect justice and wrath on Jesus on the cross. And he takes the, the punishment that you and I deserve for our sin, that shame that we feel, that, that terrified feeling, if God was in the room right now, holy and, and awesome, and we were left with all of our thoughts and our motives and all the things that we've ever done, the secret things, the hidden shame, we would just be blown away by God. And yet Jesus says, no, I'm going to take that on myself. 
I'm going to take that sin for you and I'm going to carry it and I'm going to be punished on the cross. And because Jesus is God, the ability for him to take all sin from all time is possible. And so when he goes to the cross, he pays for every single one of us if we choose to believe in him. And then God tells us that, that actually he, it's his will that all should come to the knowledge of him. That he wants everyone to be saved. That he wants everyone to come to Jesus. Does that mean everyone gets saved? It means that everyone has the freedom to come and choose. Just because God knows the beginning and the end, just because God has foreknowledge and understands all things and knows all choices, God still tells us and promises us that we have free will. That we don't need to overthink these things, but actually we just need to be able to look at ourselves and recognize that we're not God, that we've fallen short of God's standards. And we need to look at Jesus and see that he lived as we should have done and recognize that it's his death, it's his resurrection that gives us hope of a new life. That's the promise of God. That's the good news of the gospel, that Jesus came into a dark place and brought light. And so one of the ways you can respond to this this morning is to recognize your own sinfulness, to make a decision to say sorry to God, to repent, to turn away from that sin, and turn towards a heavenly Father who knows everything. And even in knowing everything, offers this wonderful gift of salvation to you and to me. And it can be overwhelming. We can think, oh, but I've done so much. If only you knew. God does know. And yet he still offers it. And so I'm going to pray in a minute, and I'll give you an opportunity to... Um, to just, just pray a prayer of repentance and, and ask God for forgiveness and ask him to come into your life. And, and he promises this wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit. See, God is Trinity. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And what he promises is that when we give our lives to Jesus, that he will fill us with his Spirit, and that Spirit will come and change us. We have the very Spirit of God, the presence of God living within us, who then begins to work in our lives and change us and make us more like him. Do we still mess up? Of course we do, but God knew that. You know, what you did last night, what you did last week, God knew that when he saved you. And there's a real reassurance in the fact that God knows everything and yet still wants us and still wants to be with us and wants to save us. And then maybe for some of us, we're Christians this morning, you're listening in and, and I don't know what you're going through in, in lockdown and COVID and things like that. There's all kinds of challenges we face, isn't there? And um, how much time are you giving to pursuing the knowledge of God during this season? I want to just encourage you and, and remind you again that, that that's where our deepest joy comes from. You know, when you get up in the morning, do you, do you turn to the pages of Scripture or do you turn to your phone app and see what the weather's going to be like? And I just want to encourage you, not in a legalistic way, but just to pursue God, to pursue knowledge of Him. It's a wonderful thing to do and it, it's what changes us. And when we read the truth about who He is and what He's done for us, that's what changes, that's what has the effect and makes us more like Jesus. When we take our eyes off him and we spend more time reading the news and looking into things that we just don't need to know about, actually we find ourselves just drifting along. And maybe you found that in this season. It's been tricky. I found it that I've been drifting on and off and, and you just find that one day goes into the next, into the next. But, but why not make a decision today before God and just say, God, you know, I want to I know more about you. I want to come closer to you. I want to draw into you this morning. So I'm going to pray. Let me pray, and, and, and then we'll finish. So Heavenly Father, I, I just thank you that you know everything about me. I thank you for your Holy Spirit who, who's with me right now. I thank you that you are so loving, so kind, so gracious, so willing to, to let me fall and pick me up again and let me fall and pick me up again, Lord, that there is nothing I can do to out the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness of your cross. And Lord, for those that are listening this morning, watching this morning, Lord, that, that don't know you. Holy Spirit, will you come right now and meet with them in a way they know? And if you're feeling that right now, if you just feel, do you know what, I want this relationship with God. I want to know more about what you're talking about. You can just pray this prayer. Heavenly Father, I'm sorry for the sin in my life. I'm sorry that I have not lived my life to glorify you. And I thank you for Jesus. I thank you that he died on the cross to pay the price for my sin. And Father, will you fill me with your spirit and give me a new life in you so that I can walk with you and get to know you and fulfill the purposes and the plans that you have for me. In Jesus' name, amen. Wonderful. If you prayed that prayer this morning, I would love to hear from you. Just uh, drop us an email or, or fill in the response form at the end. And, uh, and for those of us that are Christians, let's just consider the things of God. Let's continue to press into him 
Let's continue to, to get together with other Christians and pray where we're allowed to and, uh, and just spend time rejoicing and, and celebrating who our God is. That's what changes us, is spending that time in that relationship. So um, I'm going to hand back to the, the band now and, and we're just going to sing our praise to God in response to what we've heard this morning. Thank <laughs> you.